Hi guys, so in this video I'm going to talk about what's really a monster topic. Um, tumor immunology is probably one of the fastest growing fields. Um, the role that the immune system plays in not only allowing tumors to grow, but then ultimately hopefully fighting tumors so that patients survive cancer has been really underappreciated until about 10 years ago. And the role that immunology plays in cancer has just, I mean, it exploded is not even a big enough word. Um, billions of dollars of research uh, probably go into this each year, at least millions. Um, and it's just, it's such a huge topic. People do their PhDs in this, um, you know, doctors spend their lives studying this concept. So really what I'm giving you here is just kind of some basic, very basic understandings of the relationship between the tumor microenvironment the fighting immune response and the immunotherapeutics that are being used or hopefully will be used in the near future to fight cancer. So what I really want you to get out of this video, and this is going to be kind of a longer video, so you may want to kind of take some time to chunk it down into the, these different sections, is first off, what are the different tumor specific antigens? You'll hear me refer to them as TSAs. So this is basically how did the tumors come about? Um, it's more than just the mutations as you'll see in a minute because since we're talking about antigens, um, it's also how the immune response is going to see the tumor. Um, the next thing is basically what should the immune response be doing? So what I'll call the normal immune response. Under the best circumstances, when we have a healthy, immunocompetent person, what does our immune system do on probably an almost you know, daily basis to fight cancer? What is the tumor microenvironment? This is a really important one because the tumor actually fights back. And um, you, know, you see it in movies all the time where, you know, uh, somebody from within the group does something to undermine the plans. Um, tumor is kind of a master manipulator of its own. It's ourselves. It's our own selves. And because they know all our tricks, they know how to use them against us. So it's really insidious that way. And then the last part is immunotherapy, which, like I said, is just kind of exploding. So we're going to go through each of these four concepts in this video from kind of a global 30,000 foot view. Um, I love tumor immunology. I'm happy to talk to you about it. I think it's an incredibly interesting field, so happy to answer questions and discussion points on this one. Okay, so first off, let's just talk about what cancer is. Um, cancer is loosely described as a genetic or epigenetic disease helped by the failure of the host immune response system, and that allows the tumor to develop and progress. Um, and here's actually kind of the crux of it. It's you, but it's not you, and that's good. So and why I gave this tagline of when you don't even know yourself anymore, um, you want to not know yourself. Remember, the immune system is entirely set up on this self versus non-self basis. We try to attack things that aren't ours and keep what is ours. So what's good for us is when there's a tumor that has transformed the cells in such a way that our body no longer recognizes them as self. So they become foreign cells. Anything foreign is fair game. So when we think about tumor immunology, what I want you to think about is basically how did the immune response fail to allow the tumor to grow? How can we use the immune response to fight tumors either under normal circumstances or because of immunotherapy? And then describe the different pathways that lead to different tumor antigens. I'm not gonna talk about tumor um, invasion or development really. I'm gonna leave that to pathology because pathologists love that stuff. Um, but I'm gonna talk about basically the different antigens that our cells might see because tumor is actually very antigen specific, which is both good and bad for us from a therapeutic standpoint.
All right, so first let's talk about these antigens. I've already referred to them as TSAs. These are tumor specific antigens. You might also hear the term TAA, tumor associated antigens. Basically, these are just antigens that we see on tumor or cancerous cells. Um, the other kind of part of this is something that you'll hear me to refer to as immune surveillance, okay? Immune, immune surveillance is a normal process. It's kind of what your body does all the time. When we talk about tumor surveillance, it's literally that the immune response is patrolling the body to recognize and destroy host cells which express tumor-specific antigens. But your body's kind of always doing that anyway, looking for both pathogens and tumor cells. So TSAs can include a lot of different things. It's actually believed that TSAs are expressed pretty frequently over the course of a person's life, but that a normal competent immune system is able to eliminate them as they appear. So in order for the body to fight the tumor effectively, the TSA has to be sufficiently different from the normal host cell protein, such that a CD8 positive T cell or an NK cell will see the TSA as non-self and try to kill it. That's kind of the crux of this whole thing. Um, and the reason is that basically tumors are considered an endogenous antigen. We don't get them from somewhere outside. They may be induced by things outside, but we don't get them from somewhere outside, which means since they're an endogenous antigen, we're largely talking about MHC class one loading. And when we talk about MHC class one loading, we're really talking about CD8 positive cytolytic T cells, which is great. They're cytotoxic. They're gonna kill the cell that's hosting the tumor. So that's a great idea. But how do we get there? So first let's talk about the different tumor um, specific antigens, okay? So the first one is actually pretty simple. It's just mutated self proteins. Your mother is always telling you to put sunscreen on. Um, I have a son. He is a redhead and his skin is practically clear, like the kid is translucent. If I could dump him in a vat of sunscreen every time he left the house, I would. Why? Because we have a huge carcinogen just floating up in the sky. Um, so the sun, UV rays are damaging and carcinogenic. Everybody knows that. Um, radiation, which I guess is technically the sun. Anyway, I'm not a physicist, but radiation induced or um, carcinogen from chemicals. There's even talk about things that we eat could be carcinogenic. So all of these different um, you know, chemicals, exposures, whatever, can lead to mutated self proteins. When the self protein leads to abnormal growth or proliferation or, you know, just cells being in a place that they shouldn't be, the self protein is going to be different enough that the body will hopefully recognize it and try to kill it. Okay, so the next one is a little bit more complex and you may wanna go look up some, um, cell biology or biochemistry or molecular biology to understand this one. These are mutated tumor suppressor genes. The body has several genes known as tumor suppressor genes. These are heavily involved in cell cycle regulation. When they become dysregulated, the cell may cycle too quickly, leading to tumor growth. Um, so there are a couple different examples of that. Um, there are oncogene products like RAS, BCR, and ABL, which are fusion proteins. And then there are tumor suppressor gene products like P53. All of these really regulate how cells cycle. Um, and abnormal cycling leads to mass proliferation. When you have mass proliferation, you get tumor growth. Um, so it's kind of simple. Um, the other one, and this is kind of similar, is when you have over or aberrant expression of a self protein. So it's a self protein, but there's too much of it, or it's in the wrong place. Um, so for example, we expect to see um, certain antigens like uh, tyrosinase in certain parts of the body, but if it's expressed somewhere else, that could be a problem. Or if there's too much of it, that could also be a problem. So those are kind of the ways we can think about that. That's another class of aberrant expression. Um, another one to think of would be like MAJ3 or um, NYESO1. That's a protein that is produced by several types of tumors. For example, melanoma, lung, breast cancer, but they're not really produced by normal cells. 
Um, there are also hormone linked ones. For example, um, HER2, which a lot of people have heard of, HER2. It's also known as ERBB2, which is human epidermal growth factor receptor 2. Basically, it's a growth factor receptor and it's found on some tumor cells, most notably breast cancer, but also some lymphomas. So that's another way we could potentially see um, cancer or tumor antigens. The last one, and the one that is obviously most near and dear to my heart, is oncogenic viruses. I talk to you guys about microbiology all the time. Um, there are a lot of viruses that actually are um, heavily associated or the cause of tumors down the line. Um, Kaposi's sarcoma, which we tend to see in a lot of HIV positive patients, is actually associated with a herpes virus. Um, so that's actually um, KS. HV. Um, Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, I haven't talked about that one too much, but Burkitt's lymphoma is entirely associated with EBV latent infection. Um, hepatitis B virus, HBV, that one can cause, you guessed it, hepatic cancer, so basically liver cancer. Um, and then other ones that you might think of would be like HTLV1. HTLV1 is associated with leukemia. Um, and then the other one that we talk about a lot, and there's actually a vaccine for it now, is human papillomavirus. So HPV, there are certain serotypes of HPV that are associated with cervical cancer. And we've now actually developed a vaccine so that we can hopefully see some of those um, cancers go down. So basically what happens is that there are virus specific antigens that will be expressed within these infected cells that basically transform the cell surface in order for the immune system to recognize them and eliminate them now that they're tumor cells. I know, mind blowing. Okay, so how would the body normally fight cancer? I mentioned early on that immune surveillance, tumor surveillance probably takes place kind of all the time. And that frequently without, within a person's life, the normal competent immune response is going to be able to take care of some of these precancerous or early tumor cells so that cancer doesn't happen. Um, so what is that normal response? Well, when we think of tumor antigens, we should consider this normal process. The process is essentially similar to fighting an endogenous infection, like a viral infection. So we're gonna use endogenous MHC class one peptide loading, right? Um, for those of you who go to school where I teach, you learned about that in your first um, immunology microbiology block in the first year of med school in the case Robert May. Um, this basically means that the majority of tumor antigens are recognized by CD8 positive CTLs, which will kill the cell expressing the antigen. We can further break down who our main fighters are just based on the type of response we would use for an intracellular response. So if you think about it that way, you actually already know a whole lot about tumor immunology. So the first thing always, because I always say, cytokines are the key to understanding immunology, is pro-inflammatory cytokines. We're gonna want a really strong pro-inflammatory response. So we're gonna want interferons. Um, I only am showing here interferon gamma, but you would also have some interferon alpha and interferon beta, and that's actually really important. Um, I know we typically think of those as an antiviral response, but remember when I used to talk about how they were kind of the save yourselves signal, that they would basically tell nearby cells, you know, stop um, endocytosis, stop protein, um, upregulation, increased expression of MHC class one, you know, they would kind of tell everybody else to chill out and batten down the hatches. Well, that's also good for cancer because think about it, cancer needs to replicate. If this tells all of the cells around it, stop replicating, just express MHC class one so we can see what's going on, that's great because if the cell already has tumor antigens, MHC class one can be loaded with it and the cell can be killed. So these are actually really helpful. And they'll be expressed by cells nearby that are sensing these tumor antigens, okay? Um, so those are good cytokines to have. But remember, we're talking about an intracellular response. So that means we're going to want a whole bunch of Th1 cells. So basically, you're going to have some cells that die just because cells die. Tumor cells die at a slower rate, but they can be hurt, and you can get some antigens that get picked up. An immature dendritic cell will pick up some of those antigens, take it to the nearby lymph node, and be able to express it 
on MHC class two and MHC class one. This is a process known as cross presentation, which I didn't talk about a lot in um, the earlier blocks, but really it's just the ability to express antigens on both pathways. And that's really important in tumor immunology. In fact, many of our host cells can undergo a process of cross presentation um, where endogenous antigens are actually loaded in place of the invariant peptide that normally goes in the MHC class II peptide binding group through this process. And that allows for the engagement of CD4 positive Th1 cells. Why is that important? Because once these babies are activated, they're going to secrete interferon gamma, IL-2, and IL-12. And we need all of that because remember, that's what's actually going to help our CD8s. That's going to allow them to proliferate. It's going to allow them to differentiate into vicious tumor fighting killers. Okay. It's also going to tell the B cells to go ahead and differentiate into IgG secreting plasma cells also really important okay because when we have these antibodies we can actually start to engage our innate immune response even better i know it's kind of crazy but i want you to think back to how the adaptive immune response and the innate immune response work together okay so even though the innate comes first it's bolstered by the adaptive so our nk cells now with the approach of the antibodies can perform ADCC, that's antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity on the tumor antigen, which is great because that makes them more effective killers. Otherwise, the NK cells, remember, they work on that signal of stop and go, which is very effective because many tumors actually lack expression of MHC class one, so NK cells will kind of kill them anyway, but this just gives them another tool. The other thing that happens is that you have AICD, antibody-induced complement-mediated cell death which basically just means that now we can get binding of C1, which leads to the C3 convertase, which leads to C3 binding, C5 convertase, and eventually the membrane attack complex, which will kill the tumor cell. Um, you're also still gonna have phagocytes that are gonna be eating up some of these dead cells. Now, let's not forget that CD8 T cells are kind of the star of this show. So after they get some nice IL-2 and interferon from the CD4s, they're gonna come down here and they're gonna kill in a variety of ways. Like the NK cells, they can release a bunch of granzymes and perforin, killing each individual cell. They also, remember, have this fast, fast ligand pathway, which will allow them to kill the cells. But that only works if the tumor cell is actually expressing fast ligand. So you need both. It can't just be that the CD8 shows up and decides to kill it. For that, only granzymes and perforin should work. So this is how it should work. This is how we're supposed to fight this monster that is cancer but we know it all doesn't always work this way, right? Because not everybody survives cancer. So what's going wrong? So as I mentioned before, most of the time the immune response doesn't fail because most of the time you don't have cancer. Um, it is possible that developed cancers represent an occasional failure of a system that has otherwise been eliminating transformed cells all your life. If the tumor has managed to initiate, progress, and establish, then one of the reasons for certain is the failure of the immune surveillance system. And there are kind of three ways this might happen. First off, you might have an inherent or acquired deficit or defect in your host immune response. Obviously, the one that springs to mind the most is HIV and AIDS. Remember that these patients, because they lack CD4s, the entire immune response becomes dysregulated, including eventually our CD8s. Um, other patients who we worry about are transplant patients. Um, transplant patients actually um, develop cancers um, fairly often, and it's one of the things that you have to kind of keep very vigilant about um, because they don't have the means to fight anymore because we're suppressing that immune response. Um, there's actually an interesting story that there were two recipients of renal transplants from a deceased donor, and they both developed a genetically identical melanoma to that of the donor. The donor had been cured of that melanoma 16 years prior to donating her kidneys. So the donor didn't have melanoma at the time of donating her kidneys. Um, and part of the reason was her immune system was robust enough to keep it in check. She had it, she was cured, and there was some sort of immune memory going on that was keeping her safe. But once it was transplanted into the recipients and the recipients were immunosuppressed to keep them from rejecting the kidneys, they developed the melanoma. 
Um, so it's kind of an interesting way to think about the role the immune response plays in normally protecting you. Um, there are also, remember, tumors are the results of mutagenesis, right? There's the mutations. So you can actually get uncontrolled mitosis leading to somatic mutations. Um, so this is kind of what I talked about above with tumor-specific antigens. There are certain mutations that may happen within the tumor as it rapidly proliferates that help it avoid detection by the immune response. These mutations may also occur as a result of pharmacologic pressure. This is similar to how not finishing a course of antimicrobials can lead to resistance within the organism. So when a patient has been on some, the same oncologic therapy for a prolonged period of time, the tumor cells that didn't die might not have died because they weren't susceptible to that oncologic therapy. So then when you stop the therapy, they grow even more. You try it again, now that's resistant. Um, some examples of somatic mutations that result in reduced detection by the immune response might include things like reduced expression of the TSA. If we have less expression of the TSA, the immune response can't see it. You can also reduce expression of MHC be either one or two. If you reduce expression of two, you have no CD4TH1s to produce all those lovely cytokines. If you reduce expression of MHC class one, the CD8 T cells can't see it. So kind of a double-edged sword there. Sword there. Um, the other thing that might happen is that you might reduce the efficacy of loading antigenic peptides into MHC molecules. Remember that pathway is still a process. So you can't, um, if, if you mess with the process in some way, if there's some mechanism that's leading to these cells not being able to load their actual peptides, then the whole process kind of breaks down and you have the same issue as if you reduced MHC class one or two. Now, the last is actually kind of the most important. The tumor itself is tricky. I mentioned before that it kind of wants to um, undermine all our plans, right? We have this great plan for attacking the tumor, but these are our own cells. So it knows the plan inside and out. It's a mole. It's, you know, a, um, it's a betrayal. It knows everything that we're going to do to fight it. And so what does it do? It counteracts it. It makes the immune environment within the tumor immunosuppressant. And this is called the tumor microenvironment. And it has a huge effect in tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, which we'll talk about in a minute. These are sometimes referred to as TILs. All right, so as I mentioned previously, all of our mechanisms for fighting tumors are highly pro-inflammatory. Tumor microenvironments, on the other hand, are very immunosuppressive. Basically, if we look at this, I know this looks a huge mess, but let's try to figure it out, okay? So, in the normal immune response, we would want a lot of TNF, because that's pro-inflammatory. A lot of IL-1, pro-inflammatory. Um, we'd also, I'm trying to find ones that are good in here, it's kind of hard. We'd want T cells. These T cells would typically produce interferons and IL-2 and IL-12, which would basically arm our NK cells, right? And the NK cells would also like the IL-2 and the interferon. And all of this actually leads to a pro-inflammatory pathway, right? And that's good. That helps us kill, okay? But the tumor is sneaky. So basically what happens is that in here, this is kind of your tumor, all of these purple cells. The tumor cells themselves go after three things. They go after the cytokine environment, they go after changing the T cells, and they go after building blood vessels. Why? Tumors are hungry. They need food. They're rapidly growing. So they produce things like VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, PGE2, um, which actually uh, also kind of helps with um, keeping dendritic cells um, immature and increasing vascular endothelial growth. Um, so all of these are kind of inhibitory, okay? They have a lot of CXCL8, which actually helps recruit cells to the site, but it's the wrong kind of cells because the other things they have a lot of are IDO, indolamine 2,3-deoxygenase. Remember, that's really immunosuppressive. It basically is really good for T regulatory cells and it starves Th1 cells, okay? The other thing they have a lot of is IL-10. They'll also secrete cytokines like IL-4. 
So what you wind up with, instead of a Th1 cell, you wind up with Th2 cells and T regulatory cells. T regulatory cells are actually going to inhibit it. Now I can hear some of you over there going, wait a minute, I thought T cells differentiated in secondary lymphoid organs. And you're right, most of the time they do. But what I'm introducing to you now is a concept known as plasticity. Most of the time when I've talked about T cells, I've talked about their differentiation at the time of their activation, which makes it seem that they're locked in, that they're always going to be a Th1 cells. But T cells are the product of their environment. So if a really great Th1 cell shows up in an environment like this, where it's all IDO and IL-10 and IL-4 and immature dendritic cells that aren't providing a lot of stimulation, what happens? It changes. It kind of changes its style and it becomes more and more tolerogenic or it becomes anergic. And that's actually really key because these tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are our only way to fight. So basically what happens is we gear them up for battle, we send them into battle, and the battlefield tells them to chill out. And it does so with cytokines. So we take our pro-inflammatory cytokines and we make them anti-inflammatory cytokines because now we're creating a different immune response. Essentially, this means there's a lack of IL-12. When you don't have IL-12, you don't get NK cells. You also reduce expression of FC gamma receptors, which basically knocks out your complement response. And our DCs, while they're good at phagocytosis, they're only really gonna eat things that are dying. And if the tumor is healthy for a tumor, they're not really gonna be dying. Also, if you note here, there isn't a lot of cytokines that are gonna be recruiting neutrophils, which are our other main phagocytes. Basically, we're lacking phagocytes because we're lacking inflammation. So we've effectively knocked out our cytokine and our innate immune responses. The adaptive immune responses might be showing up, but with all of these cytokines, we've got nothing that's arming CD8s. We're lacking interferon, we're lacking um, IL-12. We still have some IL-2, but really we have IL-2, IL-10, IL-4, and TGF-beta. So CD8s, mm, not so much. CD4s, they became Tregs and Th2s. So we've gone from what was a really great pro-inflammatory response and we've made it anti-inflammatory, which is exactly what the tumor wants. Yeah, you might have some IgG that shows up, but is it really gonna be enough? And the answer is no. And that's what happens, is once the tumor starts to grow, it can change the tide. And as it gets bigger and bigger, the closer you get to kind of the epicenter of that tumor, the more tolerogenic the environment is. All right, so that's kind of depressing, right? The tumor is working against us. But here's the good news. One of the things we figured out in the last couple of years is that we are not helpless in this whole thing. Our bodies fight cancer every single day. We just need to help it out a little bit. And we do that all the time. So we're actually getting pretty good at stopping immune responses. Let's start bolstering them. We know what goes into one. Let's get into the kitchen and start cooking. So the first thing we can do is vaccinate. Vaccines are a great thing. We can vaccinate against viruses that are known for transforming cells and are high risk for developing cancer. The most common example of this I've already talked about is the HPV vaccine, which includes vaccines for the high risk forms of the human papillomavirus 16 and 18. You get that vaccine before you've ever been exposed to the human papillomavirus and you're golden. The next one, checkpoint inhibitors. This is a really exciting field of research right now. Um, I actually really um, love to think about the possibilities of checkpoint inhibitors. Checkpoint inhibitors are monoclonal antibodies, which basically target molecules on T cells that when engaged inhibit the function of the T cell. So let's think this through. Here's my T cell, okay? This is an antigen presenting cell or a host cell. It kind of doesn't matter because um, this is gonna be a CD8 T cell, right? It's out in the periphery, so it doesn't matter. So here's my TCR, it's reacting with an antigen, MHC, yada, yada. Okay, so now let's start with the easy one. When a T cell get act gets activated, it needs to have CD28, right? CD28 binds to the molecule B7. 
it's either B7.1 or B7.2, CD80, CD86. It really doesn't matter what you call it. It's B7, okay? But once it's activated, that CD8 T cell doesn't need CD28 anymore. But what happens is, as it gets activated for longer and longer, it actually starts expressing a molecule known as CTLA-4. CTLA-4 actually has a higher affinity for B7 than CD28. As long as CD28 is bound to B7, no problem. The cell will keep being activated. But if CTLA-4 becomes bound to B7, the CD8 T cell stops functioning. It basically becomes anergic, okay? Now, here's the rub. Cancer cell or CD8 positive T cells in the tumor um, environment are basically induced to increase their expression of CTLA-4. That's one of the things that happens when there's a lot of IL-10 and TGF-beta. We see a lot more CTLA-4 come up. So when that happens, CTLA-4 binds B7, which is also in high supply in the tumor microenvironment. Remember, it's sneaky. And basically, it tells the CD8 T cells, quit it, go take an A. So what some amazing people did was basically they made a antibody that blocks any signaling from CTLA-4. Um, this one is known as apilimumab. I'm terrible at pronouncing drug names. You guys know this by now. But apilimumab basically blocks this interaction says, nope. And when that happens, the CD8 can keep working. So basically, it stops energy. In the past, this one has been used to treat melanoma. Okay, so what about PD-1? All right, so let's go back. We have our CD8 T cell. It's been working for a long time, and it's exhausted. So it's upregulated expression of this molecule PD-1. PD-1 stands for program death one. All right, now, you guessed it. In the tumor microenvironment, our host cell or our tumor cell, sure, it's got its tumor antigen and the CD8 T cell can even see it, but it's insidious. It's also expressing the ligand to PD-1, which is PD-L1. What that does is basically say, shh, I know, you're tired, you're exhausted, go to sleep, it's okay. And the cell does. And it just basically, it stops producing cytokine. It stops proliferating. It just does nothing. It basically, it's the tumor telling the body, it's okay, you don't have to fight. So that's great for the tumor, right? But it's really bad for us. So what we need to do, block that interaction. So we've made a whole bunch of drugs that either block PD-1 or PD-L1. These drugs have been shown to be helpful in a wide range of cancers, melanoma, Merkel cell skin cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, kidney cancer, bladder cancer, head and neck cancer, and Hodgkin uh, lymphoma. So some of the drugs that you might hear about from are um, Pembrolizumab, you know, I'm terrible at these, um, Nivolumab, um, these are kind of the big ones. And actually there's now even some studies that are going into what if we use them together? So the big one is if you're using Apilimumab, which is um, CTLA-4 and um, Nivolumab, um, because basically at that point, you're basically attacking the CD8 T cells or inducing the T cells to act on two levels, energy and exhaustion. So this is very exciting research, obviously, and it's currently being used in patients. So the other thing, cytokines. Cytokines, we know all about them. We know that they're the master manipulators of any immune response and that they can really be potent in boosting an immune response. The downside. Remember after you get like a flu vaccine that you feel terrible for like three days? And that's just like a little interferon. So what if I gave you a ton of interferon? Because interferon is totally one of the cytokines that we give. The other one that we give is IL-2. These are really, really rough on the body, but they work. They work really well. Um, so basically, they've been used in leukemia, lymphoma, melanoma, bladder, and kidney cancer. Um, melanoma in particular is one that I've noticed that they actually use it a lot in. The interferon they're using here is interferon alpha, which is very, very potent. 
One of the things they've done to try to minimize the cytotoxicity is do antibody cytokine fusion proteins, which basically makes it so that the antibody targets it directly to the tumor site. That one, alters the microenvironment of the tumor so that those tumor infiltrating lymphocytes maybe get a little bit more of a pro-inflammatory microenvironment to work in, but it also prevents some of the systemic effects. This has been pretty promising, but it's largely been replaced by research on checkpoint inhibitors because the checkpoint inhibitor have been a little bit more potent. However, the cytokines are still being used. Um, tumor antigen vaccination. This is one that I think people would love to see make work. There is currently only one approved vaccine-based therapy for advanced cancer. Um, that's Sapul cell or Provenge. Um, this is basically where you have an autologous dendritic cell preparation, which is engineered to target prostate acid phosphatase, so PAP. Um, so basically what happens is that you take the patient's um, blood, you leukophoresis it, you take the antigen presenting cells, you culture them with um, the antigen and in the presence of GMCSF, basically makes the antigen presenting cells present the PAP. You then put it back in with the T cells um, and put those in the patient and the patient's cells are better able to respond. So you're basically increasing the amount of antigen presentation with the tumor specific antigen. Um, there's still continued interest in expanding this approach and tumor vaccine trials for melanoma specifically continue to happen. Um, and I think there's a lot of hope to get this off the ground. Currently it's very time consuming and expensive, but um, hopefully in the future something to look forward to. So that is kind of a gross overview of tumor immunology. Remember, I want you to think of it from a couple of directions. I want you to think of tumor-specific antigens. How do we get them? I want you to think about why the microenvironment of a tumor is so immunosuppressive and how we can use immunotherapy to boost the anti-tumor response. If you can do those three things, you know enough about tumor immunology to get yourself through most of what people would ask of you. Good luck.